Thank you. Ah, hi. I'm Jessica Hansen. I'm so thrilled to be back for my second Odd Salon and perhaps to give all of you a damn good burking tonight. Um, to understand why you probably don't want a burking, let me take you back to Edinburgh in the early 1800s. Edinburgh was the place to study anatomy and science anatomy. Uh, students were flocking there to dissect human cadavers. So as the demand for human cadavers was on the rise, unfortunately new laws meant that supplies of cadavers were severely restricted to a very few per university. This gave rise to an illicit black market in human bodies and a new class of what we in SF would call entrepreneurs. <laughs> known as resurrectionists or grave robbers who could make as much from, from one fresh human corpse as they could in a year's worth of honest labor. <laughs> While scientists were willing to pay these grave robbers big bucks for a human corpse, rich people were unfortunately willing to pay big bucks to keep those corpses in the ground. They were paying armed guards, renting big slabs of rock to put over their graves until bodies decomposed, or buying these big weird cages to bury their coffins inside. Rich people were basically ruining everything. <laughs> and they were making it very hard for grave robbers to keep up with that growing demand for human bodies. These social and economic conditions created the perfect opportunity for these two besties, William Burke and William Hare, to really disrupt the cadaver industry. <laughs> <laughs> While news was breaking about the profitability of the scandalous scheme of grave robbing, Burke and Hare were just two Irish immigrants trying to make their way on the mean streets of Edinburgh by hawking clothes and cobbling shoes. Burke was said to be super handsome and charming, while his bestie hair was less flatteringly called hideous and horrible. <laughs> they and their lady loves, Helen McDougall and Margaret Hare, also ran boarding houses on the side to make ends meet. One day, one of their lodgers named Donald, who unfortunately owed them a few months of rent, died unexpectedly of a condition called dropsy. Since he had no family or friends to settle the debt or claim his body, Burke and Hare decided this was a prime opportunity to see if scientists would actually pay as much for a body as they'd heard. They went looking for the famous scientist and anatomist Dr. Alexander Monroe, but they ran into a student who said with a dead body, they'd have more luck with the sketchier Dr. Robert Knox. Knox paid them seven pounds, 10 shillings, or a few months of wages for the body, and as they left, an assistant said they'd be happy to see them again when they had another to dispose of. But unfortunately, their lodgers just weren't dying fast enough for this to be a lucrative trade. So when the next lodger came down with a little bit of a cough, they decided to see if they could speed things along. <laughs> They snuck into poor Joseph's room in the middle of the night, and our boys had their very first experience with burking. As defined by the Oxford English Dictionary, burking is the practice of one person putting their entire body weight on top of a victim, virtually immobilizing them, while another plugs their nose and mouth until they suffocate. Burkalicious. Knox was so pleased with the freshness of Joseph's recently burked body that the men were paid more than they would normally earn in a year. Burking proved to be a very efficient, highly lucrative, and virtually undetectable form of murder. And there was mad cash to be made on the streets of Edinburgh by basically burking everyone in sight. <laughs> the key to a good burking, of course, was whiskey. They would normally target someone, a woman, usually, preferably someone who was old, frail, maybe far from home, but most importantly, who enjoyed getting really, really drunk. Once they'd drunk to the point of needing a nice lie down, these guys would give them a good burking and drop their bodies off to Dr. Knox. 
These guys burked so many people in 1828 that there's only time to highlight a few. <laughs> Beginning with Mary Patterson, a plucky young teenager, victim number four, who just left her rigid reform school to try, strike out and make a life on her own. It was early on the morning of her first full day of freedom that Mary and her friend Janet ran into Burke at a whiskey shop, which was apparently a super normal place to start your day back then. <laughs> Burke lured these lovely ladies back to his house with the promise of breakfast and whiskey. And when Burke's lovely lady, Helen McDougall, showed up a few hours later, Mary was already passed out drunk on the table, and Janet said, whoa, you're married? I am out of here. When Janet finally came back a few hours later to find Mary, unfortunately, she was gone. She was already being pickled in Dr. Knox's dissecting rooms. Later, victims shamed, perhaps because she was young, beautiful, and female, Mary was the only of the victims that was ever basically described as asking for it. <laughs> Victim number nine was perhaps the most unlikely because she was being helped home in the arms of a policeman when Burke offered to host her for the night at his lodging. <laughs> Victim number 13 was a local laundry lady who I probably should have skipped for the sake of time but I find her particularly tragic because the monsters made her do two full days of their laundry before they burked her. <laughs> Victim number 15 was Daft Jamie, a well-known and well-loved young man in town who had both physical and mental challenges, including deformed feet that made it difficult for him to walk. Jamie didn't like drinking, so unlike the other victims, he was both sober and strong and put up a valiant but futile fight for his life. Word had already spread around town that Daft Jamie was missing when some of Dr. Knox's students said they thought they recognized him on the dissecting table. Dr. Knox decided this particular cadaver needed to lose its feet and face immediately and its dissection should be expedited. That brings us to their final burking on October 31st, 1828. Some of Helen's relatives were visiting, but they were asked to move to a different lodging for the night so that the men could entertain a woman named Margaret Dougherty in town looking for her missing son. Upon returning the next day, these nosy in-laws found Dougherty's body in a pile of straw, refusing a sizable donation, or donation, a bribe, a <laughs> donation, uh, for their silence. They returned with the police, and unfortunately, the body had vanished. It was found later in Dr. Knox's dissecting rooms, and the police got a sneaky suspicion that there might be more victims. As details of Dougherty's death came out, others came forward, like poor Janet, who had never given up looking for her friend Mary. But the forensic science didn't exist to prove that Dougherty had been murdered. So with no other bodies, no evidence, and no witnesses, the entire hope for conviction rested on getting a conviction. Lucky for the police, Hare was just as hideous and horrible as everyone said, and he turned in his best friend, providing a full confession in exchange for his and his wife's freedom. The case became an international sensation, and the anxiously anticipated trial against Helen McDougall and William Burke took place on Christmas Eve of 1828. After over 24 hours straight of testimony, it took just 50 minutes to convert, convict Burke, and the judge sentenced him to both death and public dissection. <laughs> over 40,000 people gathered in the streets of Edinburgh to see him hang on January 28, 1829, and then publicly dissected by Dr. Alexander Monroe, the man he'd been searching for only a year before. It's perhaps poetic that Burke's blood, like that of his victims, ended up on the hands of the anatomists. Burke, too, proved more valuable in death than life. His skeleton, his death mask, and a pocketbook made of his skin that was recently valued as priceless by the Antiques Roadshow <laughs> all remain on display in Edinburgh. Helen McDougall's involvement was never proven, and while she and the Hares remained free, they all met angry, violent mobs of outraged people as they tried to flee Edinburgh, and their fates remain unknown. 
The police couldn't prove that Knox had broken any laws, but the public had pinned him as the ringleader, and a rhyme began to circulate. Up the close and doon the stair, button bin with Burke and hair. Burke's the butcher, hair's the thief, Knox the boy that buys the beef. <laughs> he resigned and moved to London, and dying of natural causes in 1862, he refused to donate his body to science and was buried intact. As Sir Walter Scott observed, a wretch who is not worth a farthing alive becomes a valuable article when knocked on the head and carried to an anatomist. Burking inspired many plays, books, and later films, and even some very creepy murder dolls that were found in a cave shortly after. But most importantly, these murders provided the political push needed to pass the Anatomy Act in 1832, which provided a ton of bodies for science and eliminated the need for grave robbing and burking by basically stripping poor people of any rights to their own bodies after death, unless they were claimed by a loved one within 48 hours. Given this, one of my biggest takeaways, as, the, as Edinburgh scientists and surgeons continued to make amazing progress on the bodies of the poor, the benefits of which were enjoyed mostly by the rich, is that is that capitalism can seriously suck for people living in poverty, making them easy prey for entrepreneurial individuals with flexible morals. My more poignant takeaway, as a woman who recently re rejoined the dating pool, is that if a hot guy or his ugly friend invite you back to their place for some of that sweet, sweet fire water we call whiskey, just say no. Unless you're up for a night of rough burking and don't mind ending up on a dissecting table by morning. So, let's raise a glass, not to burke nor hair, but instead to their 16 victims and to everyone who have given their lives and their bodies, willingly or not, to the advancement of science. <laughs> Thank you.